the world awaited Armageddon. Instead, something miraculous happened. We began to use atomic energy not as a weapon, but as a nearly limitless source of power. People enjoyed luxuries once thought the realm of science fiction. Domestic robots, fusion-powered cars, portable computers. Hey there, welcome to the Lord to Death podcast. My name is Brett, and today I'm going to make a little bit of a rant before we start. So several days ago, I decided to sit down and record this episode, and I only found out after recording when I was in the editing stage that it sounded terrible, and I couldn't exactly figure out why until I realized that I didn't switch my input from my laptop microphone to my stereo microphone. So everything sounded terrible. It's awful. I'm re-recording this again several days later and way behind my scheduled deadline. So I, I hope it turns out half as well. But today uh, we're going to take a trip back in time, which I guess is technically a step forward in time to where everything looks like it was taken out of a 50s magazine, despite it being, you know, 40, 50 some odd years ahead in the future. So today I want to explore what life was like before the Great War and Fallout that caused, well, well, the fallout that led to the events of the games. It was a strange time where everything looked retro by our standards while being several decades in the future. I feel like there has to be a better word to describe what the aesthetic was in Fallout, but the best that I can think of is retrofuturistic. And while that does technically encompass the entire aesthetic, I feel like there's something more that retrofuturistic doesn't exactly capture. Regardless, the Fallout series is terribly inconsistent with technological advances in certain areas, and it makes the aesthetic all kind of wonky. For example, you can create nuclear fusion in your pocket, but your desktop computer is still 40 pounds, uses reel-to-reel -reel tape storage, and has a monochromatic CRT monitor for the display. But there's actually a good reason for it, despite its weird inconsistencies. So the Fallout timeline is relatively similar to our own up until the Second World War or so, with some minor differences before that point. But after World War II sometime in the 50s, there was a major divergence from our timeline where humanity decided to put all of their resources into further developing nuclear technologies instead of putting their efforts into miniaturizing computers like we did. And you could use that to refute my past point about certain technologies not being as developed as they technically should have been, but I still stand by the point that if you can make electronics compact enough to make a nuclear-powered floating robotic house assistant like Codsworth, then you should certainly have had a better solution for computer storage than tape reels, and at the very least, should have had color television in the mainstream by that point. But I digress, it's a fictional world that doesn't need to make absolute sense. Like I said before, we're going to be focusing on what life might have been like before the Great War, before the nuclear apocalypse, and specifically what it was like in certain areas of the United States that we see in the games. As much as I would love to delve into what Canada was like at the time, we just don't have a whole lot of information to go off of there. With that being said, there are three main categories that I'm going to split this into. Aesthetic, technology, and society. And if you're familiar with the other episodes I've done like this in this kind of series, like... Bioshock with Rapture and Columbia, then this is going to be sort of in the same vein as that. So buckle up, because I think that aesthetic is the best place to set the mood, and Fallout 4 gave us plenty of reference in the prologue to work off of. That being said, it's not exactly the best representation of society as a whole, because not everyone lived like this. This was kind of the American dream, so to speak, but we'll get more into that in a little bit. This sequence is what I think America aspired to be, so I think it's a very good reference point for the aesthetic, at the very least, since after the Great War, that's kind of what people pulled from as kind of the ideal, you know? In the Fallout 4 prologue, we see a suburb known as Sanctuary, and it's a small one, built on a single road leading into a small island that ended with a cul-de-sac. There were a handful of single-story homes that lined either side of the street, which boasted brightly painted siding, manicured lawns, and white picket fences. Inside these houses looked like they belonged in a 50s interior design magazine with brightly colored carpets and walls, elaborate patterned rugs, and wood panel accents all over the walls and everything. Appliances were made of strong metals that had a lot of curved edges and corners with bright colored varnishes that would fit in with any KitchenAid set. 
In one's living room, you might see a fireplace, a retro monochromatic CRT television, a sturdy wooden sound system with a built-in record player, and maybe a hutch that contains some scotch and whiskey. You know, for the men. Everything that you would expect to see in a typical nuclear family home at the time, with the exception of some additional robotics to aid the wife in her chores. Above the counters, one might have installed a robotic arm that could be outfitted with whisks, paddles, and other tools to assist with cooking and cleaning. If you were particularly wealthy, you might even have your own Mr. Handy domestic robotic butler to further assist with cleaning, child rearing, and everything else that you might need. Living in these homes were people right out of I Love Lucy with their outfits leaning more towards retro than futuristic. The guys were typically seen with button-down shirts and a nice pair of slacks and maybe some dressy casual shoes. If they were feeling particularly fanciful, they might have even thrown a vest over that button-up or chose to wear a full suit and tie like our beloved vault tech salesman. The gals would have been seen in some kind of dress with a collar top or maybe a skirt blouse combo, sporting a pin-up hairstyle and maybe a nice pair of flats. They wore vibrant colors and often had some sort of pattern on their outfits, like a nice delicate floral or some nice stripes. If you take a look at the little tykes, the boys were dressed in blue jeans, a tucked-in t-shirt, and a ball cap. Very simple. And the girls might have sported something similar to their mothers and had a nice sundress on or something of the like. Outside of their houses, each family typically had at least one vehicle in their driveway. These space-age style vehicles were styled with large tail fins, more chrome than anyone needed, and flowing designs that echoed the look of a spaceship. Often bright in color with wraparound windshields and bubbly, rounded edges. So everything so far is basically standard 50s with a little bit of a robotic twist. And that's, well, that, that's pretty much the aesthetic. So, really, the aesthetic was like the Jetsons, but a little closer to the ground than Orbit City. A and speaking of old cartoons, I think it's worth noting our friend The Vault Boy and the series of rubber hose animated shorts that he appears in. The special cartoons in Fallout 4 are just fantastic, reminiscent of early Mickey Mouse cartoons. And I was going to say more morbid than those cartoons, but have you seen early Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny? They might be more disturbing than anything that happened in Fallout. But regardless, the Vault Boy was often in little cartoons that were over the top and cutesy. And I would assume that most television shows that kids would watch would have a similar vibe. I understand it's all for looks, but I find it interesting that the aesthetic clung so tightly to the 50s vibe. There were people in Fallout 3 who would mention like hippie crap when referring to the Children of Adam in Megaton. It's entirely possible that the hippie movement happened at the same time as in our timeline, it just didn't have any lasting impact on their culture. We do know that hippies existed somewhere in the Divide, who were protesting the Sino-American War just before the war in like the 70s. And by the 70s, I mean the 2070s, I guess? Yeesh. So, regardless of when the movement actually started, hippies did exist up until the end. But we certainly won't find out why I decided to hyperfixate on hippies in the Fallout universe. That's a, that's a mystery to me. To wrap up our first point on aesthetics and segue into our second point, technology, I kind of want to briefly talk about the vaults that were set up by Vault Tech because they have a little bit of a different vibe that also sets up kind of the industrial side of the world outside of these cutesy little suburbs. Because while the suburbs are great, they, again, aren't exactly a perfect representation of everything. The Fallout universe, as you might have guessed, was very reliant on nuclear technology and was under constant threat of nuclear war and... Hold up, for one second, I know what you're thinking. Nuclear war in my Fallout games? Absolutely not. Never. But hear me out. These vaults were created for the express purpose of sheltering people in the event of a nuclear apocalypse. And just a side note, I hate the word nuclear. I am having a very hard time putting it into any sentence because my mouth wants to just say... Anyways, <laughs> being bomb shelters, essentially, these vaults weren't necessarily built to be the most eye-catching. They were also built deep underground, typically in mountain ranges, in order to be safe from nuclear fallout. These vaults were built with what Vault Tech coined as Triple S technology, which stood for safety, survivability, and sanitation. And I won't go too deep into what that means exactly, but it does help kind of set the mood here. Because of these three S's, the vaults were very sterile looking, with walls of reinforced concrete and solid metal sheeting. Each one had an airlock that was protected by a blast door, and in the case of Vault 111 in Sanctuary, there was a great big elevator that led down from the blast door to the rest of the vault. Most vaults weren't built like this, however, and most of them just did well with a couple layers of blast doors to kind of keep the nasties and the fallout out. Fallout out, keep the fallout out. <laughs> 
Okay, cool. Like I mentioned before, the look of the vaults were very industrial in nature, which was a stark contrast to the bubbly suburbs that we saw on the surface. The walls were either metal or concrete and were often not really painted. If they were painted, then they were given the tiniest little bit of flair with embellishments of blues, grays, and yellows of vault tech. And this usually took form of just a giant solid strip of color going from one wall to the next. It wasn't exactly beautiful looking. The floors of the hallways were your typical poured concrete, but inside areas like cafeterias or the dormitories, there were some checkered tiles or hardwood, respectively. But outside of the common areas and hallways, a lot of the walkways were graded metal and had railings that went around different kind of machines that kept the vaults running, like reactors and the such. Now, I'm not going to ramble on about the aesthetics too much, so we'll go right into the technology inside the vaults, because I think the technology inside the vaults makes for a good introduction to what I consider to be the peak technology of the time. So because the vaults were meant to be lived in from anywhere between 10 and 50 years, and allegedly up to 250 years, they needed to be entirely self-sufficient, and they needed to be able to take care of one, two, or more generations that were going to be inside of them. Depending on how they were built and how many vault dwellers were going to be inside them, they had different methods of powering the vaults. You might think that in line with Fallout's nuclear themes that they would be all nuclear powered, but because they were so deep in the earth for the most part, the most prominent form of energy was actually geothermal. Unfortunately, this didn't work for every single vault, and so there would have been ones that did have nuclear power plants inside them. The power needed for the vault was considerable, because not only did they have to provide enough power for the lights, refrigeration, and other day-to-day -day appliances and amenities, they also had to power complex air filtration systems for breathable air, and hydro-agricultural farms for food, as well as a water purification system that would take sewage and convert it into drinkable water. Which, quick side note on that, it was all recycled water, they didn't take any water from the surface, so... Basically, if you were stuck in there for a decade, you were drinking your own and your fellow vault dwellers' pee for 10 years. That is a nightmare. But because there's no garbage day in the apocalypse, the vaults were also equipped with incinerators to get rid of daily waste and the dead when needed. On top of all that, the vaults were typically equipped with an advanced surveillance system that was a series of cameras for security reasons. Definitely not creepy voyeuristic reasons. And these cameras would link back to a central supercomputer in the Overseer's Command Center. So as you can tell, the power system needed to be quite robust because there was a lot going on down in the vaults. To help with day-to-day -day activities such as maintenance, cooking, etc., it wasn't uncommon to see a Mr. Handy present in the vaults, which we briefly talked about before. So these robots were able to float around via thrusters, change their own nuclear fuel, and perform self-maintenance to keep in tip-top shape, among all of the other things that they're programmed to do. So this was all thanks to two main components, a compact supercomputer brain that could self-program and learn new tasks as needed, and a compact nuclear core that powered them. So these two things, the miniature supercomputer and the nuclear core, were two very important things to the Fallout universe, and the Mr. Handy was a model citizen in showing how that technology worked. It's interesting to me that they could fit a supercomputer and a nuclear reactor into a robot that was no larger than a person, and yet consumer technology that we see in residential areas are still using technology that is primitive in comparison. As mentioned before, we see clunky desktop computers that still use reel-to-reel -reel tape storage and sometimes took up entire rooms. Even cameras failed to evolve past the 50s and 60s with large flash bulbs and clunky design. And yet, somehow, surveillance systems like we see in the vaults were just as compact as we would see in reality today. So, this kind of comes back to the inconsistencies that I was talking about before, where there's some things that make sense, and there's others that are just kind of like, why is this so terrible? Like, it's, it's just to fit the aesthetic and nothing else. But I once again digress. Because society in Fallout had a tunnel vision when it came to nuclear energy and the radioactive goodness that came from it, they even came up with a cola that used radioactive isotopes called Nuka-Cola Quantum. Infusing it with radiation gave the drink its signature blue glow, and only sometimes killed the people who drank it. I feel like I could make an entire episode on the history of Nuka-Cola, so if you want to hear about that wild, wild story, then let me know. We'll see. It was this societal obsession with infusing everything with nuclear or radioactive technology that ultimately caused the Great War, but it also led to certain advancements in technology that wouldn't have been possible otherwise, with products like Rad-X and Rad-Away, which were designed to limit and remove damage done by radioactive poisoning. 
So, you know, there's a little bit of give and take there. But again, the technology is weirdly inconsistent, but in a strangely consistent way. Consumer products were, aside from the personal robots that some people had, very basic and didn't really seem to evolve with the times much. But on the flip side, anything that was military or scientific grade products were decades beyond those, as evident in the Mr. Handy units or the T-51 power armor. And keeping in line with their love for nuclear energy, nuclear power plants were used to power most towns and, well, pretty much everything. Nuclear power was made so efficient and portable that they more or less replaced the internal combustion engine in cars, aeroplanes, and electrical generators, and this was thanks to nuclear fission and the creation of fission batteries. These batteries would be used to make power cells that would provide power to energy weapons and armored exoskeletons like the power armor that we see in the games. And another fun little bit of trivia is that if you look at pretty well any technology, like a television set or radio in the wastes in Fallout, you'll see a distinct lack of power cables that would plug into a wall. You could chalk it up to laziness on the devs part, sure, but you could also see it as evidence that nuclear power was so portable that it was inside all of these small appliances as well, eliminating the need to be hardwired into your home. This might also be why in Fallout 3 there's a bus in the wastelands that has a working radio in it, despite the bus being in absolute shambles being hit by a, you know, nuclear bomb. But alas, it wouldn't be the good old US of A if they didn't convert anything remotely useful into a military application as well. The Mr. Handys that we've talked about a couple of times also had a military version called the Mr. Gutsy, which was armed with a plasma gun as well as a 10mm submachine gun and or a 44 caliber pistol for longer range and either a flamethrower and or a buzzsaw for close encounters. These Mr. Gutsy units were commissioned just before the Great War and were rushed through production because of a threat of nuclear apocalypse. Because of that, the neural network in the Mr. Gutsies weren't quite working like they should have, and they didn't seem to have the level of intelligence that the civilian models had. These shortcomings caused them to, in the absence of orders, default to a patrol mode where they would wander off and use extreme prejudice to dispatch anything that wasn't authorized personnel. This flaw was generally accepted in the short term because they were in a shoot first, ask questions later stage in their conflict, and killing anything other than American citizens was okay in their books. And of course, with everything else nuclear miniaturized, so were actual nukes. They were so portable, in fact, that there was a shoulder-mounted catapult called the Fat Man developed for short-range tactical strikes. The Fat Man launched mini-nukes at a maximum range of about 150 meters, and the warhead would whistle through the air and cause a mini-nuclear explosion. Traditional nukes were shrunken down as well and were able to be launched from VTOLs rather than using a bomber plane. These vehicles were able to carry enough armaments that they could actually carpet bomb areas. And would you be surprised if I told you that Nuka-Cola, the same people who made Nuka-Cola Quantum, made nukes as well? Well, you shouldn't be surprised. The same isotope that was used in Nuka-Cola Quantum to make it glow in higher concentration was able to militarize practically anything and turn anything into a nuke. What they made was dubbed as the Nuka Nuke, but it never made it never made it past prototype phase. <laughs> And nuke a nuke is just so fun to say, but I think it's worth mentioning because the idea is just absolutely hysterical. Like, imagine Coca-Cola making nukes in World War III. That would just be amazing. And on the topic of weapons, energy weapons were also created, as I kind of mentioned before, such as the plasma weapons that I mentioned when I was talking about the Mr. Gutsy units. So these utilized electromagnets to expel plasma, which looked like your typical 50s science fiction alien guns, and they were also laser weapons, which took the form of a rifle, pistol, or gatling gun. The laser weapons were powered by microfusion cells, the same as your average television or radio, and both plasma and laser weapons saw extensive use in the military. And I have a theory that this is why the ballistic guns of Fallout were so basic and looked like they barely evolved from the Vietnam War. So rather than updating traditional firearms like the M16, for example, the nuclear era that the Fallout universe went into allowed the military to create new, more efficient methods of killing commies. And as a result, these laser and plasma weapons went into mass production while ballistic firearms were kept as more or less a backup. They were probably only maintained to ensure basic function, and instead of approving upon these designs which gave us real-world modern firearms, they basically just kept them in a box and kept updating the laser and plasma weapons. So with that being said, with the exception of the laser and plasma guns which don't exist in our world, these ballistic weapons typically followed our real-world example in terms of function and look. 
The guns were all modeled after real-world equivalents, and even though nukes were far more advanced, they still took the look of the traditional nuke, like the Fat Man bomb that was used against Japan. So it's interesting that even though they updated everything, they never really updated the look. They just kind of figured, meh, that's good enough. And taking a break from nuclear power things, in the Fallout timeline, humans also ventured into space. Although it happened a little bit differently in their universe than it happened in ours, but there were people on the moon and satellites in the sky. This also gave way to orbital weapons being created. There were four main examples that we see in the games, and I would assume that there were more from pre-war and they might have been destroyed, but I have no way to back that up. But in Fallout 3, we see the orbital missile platform codenamed High Water Trousers and the Bradley Hercules system, which was used to destroy Liberty Prime. In New Vegas, we see the laser-based orbital weapon system, the Archimedes II, and also the Kovac Muldoon support satellite that was able to carry out both orbital strikes and lend supply drops to those in the Enclave. And with all this talk about nuclear energy, I think it's worth noting that there were other forms of power out there, which we briefly touched on with the geothermal plants that powered some of the vaults. There were other renewable energy sources out there like hydroelectric plants such as the Hoover Dam, and solar plants like the Helios One power plant. There was also an island in Maine which was home to an experimental wind farm which they found was actually more efficient than nuclear energy, but it didn't really catch on because one, it was still experimental, and two, because society was so nuclear driven at that point, nothing else really mattered and innovation wasn't exactly accepted. And that brings us to our third and final point, society, which is going to be very politics heavy since pre-war was, as you can imagine, a time where imminent war was just part of society. So let's start with the general principles of what the United States were and what they kind of evolved into. The United States, as we know, was founded on liberty and justice for all. But in the 21st century, that was almost entirely dropped in favor of security, which led to the gradual repeal of civil rights. The U.S. had transitioned into being a totalitarian state by the time of the Great War, and that was brought upon by what was known as the Resource Wars, which I think is very important, so we're going to go over. The Resource Wars was a blanket term for over 25 years of conflict between basically every continent, and it resulted in the Sino-American War and the Great War happening, among others. During this time, the world relied very heavily on petroleum for making plastics, fertilizers, medicines, etc., and uranium for their love of nuclear devices. But eventually, the well ran dry. When demand exceeded supply, a number of conflicts happened, like the U.S. invading Mexico to ensure the petroleum continued to flow, as a number of economic sanctions threatened to destabilize the country. Europe did the same in 2052 to the Middle East and started a decade-long occupation for control over the region's oil deposits. As a result of these two main events, oil prices skyrocketed and bankrupted several smaller nations, causing the United Nations to eventually fall apart just three months after the occupation. In Europe is kind of where smaller nuclear exchanges started to happen, and what ultimately led to the world being put in a microwave. Because people were dropping nukes, the US closed their borders and started to hunker down, putting as much money as possible under the military following the dissolution of the European Commonwealth. They started putting more military resources into Alaska to protect it against foreign invasion, which put stress on their relationship with Canada, having been surrounded almost entirely by American military forces. The U.S. closing their borders and refusing to trade with basically any other nation came with a couple different consequences. Eventually, when nuclear fusion was perfected in a way and fusion cells were unveiled to the world, solving the U.S.'s energy crisis, they refused to help anyone else out with theirs. This caused some understandable strife and is what led to China invading Alaska in the first place, which was a serious blow to the U.S. because they could not effectively fight the war on that front, in part because Canada refused to allow U.S. military units to drive or fly across their soil to reinforce their front line in Alaska. This meant the only way to get there was around the long way, and that was just extremely ineffective. Canada not letting them go through was kind of the nail in the coffin for Canada as a country, as the U.S. got increasingly more aggressive and set the stage for Canada's colonization and annexation over the next several years. The war in Alaska waged on for several years, and it was a losing battle for both sides, but mostly the U.S. However, the completion of the T-51 power armor is what really turned the tide for the U.S. and caused the Chinese forces to crumble while American citizens were crumbling internally due to food shortages as a result of this long-lasting war, which led to widespread riots. Also, in these riots were people who were part of a labor shortage, which was brought on by automation. Robots had become so commonplace and advanced that they were replacing people in almost every sector, 
The U.S. government responded to these riots by enforcing martial law, which seems smart, which was the final step to becoming, well, a dictatorship. The military started personally intervening in these riots and started to abuse and murder their own people for the sake of peace. With the success of the T-51 power armor, the U.S. decided that they were going to launch an assault in China. And this didn't go well for a number of reasons, but the U.S. seemed to understand that this war was not one that they were going to win because of external forces and internal factors, causing the situation to just get worse rapidly. For several years before the nukes dropped, most people knew that the only way out was really a nuclear ultimatum to end this decades-long conflict, as both sides of the war were way too deep to back out amicably. So, basically, the U.S. turned into a massive military megacorporation who was exploiting their own citizens and others to wage war. This caused rabid nationalism, along with a very strong anti-communist propaganda to be spread across the country. They basically became an exaggerated version of the U.S. during the Cold War. And while we don't have a ton of information on what sort of jobs were available before the war, speaking of the labor shortages, we can infer a few things. The military had an obviously massive presence because of the constant war, and so there was always going to be a career in the military. Nuclear technology being what it was, we can assume that there was a massive science and tech industry, and that a lot of people probably went into a related field, but were probably replaced by robots in a lot of sectors. A vault tech salesman was around in the Fallout 4 prologue as well, which means that door-to-door -door sales were still alive and well, unfortunately. And I guess that's one job that not even a robot would want to degrade itself to doing. In the Fallout games, we also see that there are plenty of factories, but a lot of these were overrun by robots, which means that people probably weren't working in the factories. There might have been a few to kind of oversee things, but for the most part, it was robots on the floor. And that seemed to be a pretty constant theme throughout everything. So who knows what jobs people had? I don't. But aside from the constant war, we know that sports were still a large part of American society as a terminal in the Boston Bugle building mentioned that Boston had not won a baseball series in 159 years as of 2077. It's no surprise to me that baseball remained relevant in society. However, it was changed ever so slightly from our world, and this could have just been a dev error. But there was a baseball card that you find in-game for a pitcher, Matt the Missile Murtog who also had batting stats and other stats that looked more like a position player than a pitcher. The implication would be that the designated hitter rule was rescinded at some point, but we know that that rule existed at some point because in the GOAT test that we take in Fallout 3, designated hitter was an option as one of the test answers, which means that it did exist at some point, or maybe it was an optional rule. It really could have just been a dev error. I don't know. Football also existed as a sport in 2077 and had a couple hilarious twists to it. The most evident one being that motorcycle football was introduced, and no, I don't have really any more information on that topic, although I wish I did. We know that there was leather armor that we get in the game that was designed specifically for motorcycle football because it provided decent protection while allowing the player to be a bit more nimble than in something like metal armor. The only evidence that we ever had of any Super Bowl happening was in a transcript which had numerous continuity issues and has since been publicly denounced as false information by the developers. So I don't really feel entirely comfortable with that information provided, but I would assume that Super Bowls were still happening. So the Olympics were also still around until at least 2060, and I wouldn't be surprised if they weren't around for too much longer than that because of the global conflict leading up to the Great War. International relations weren't exactly in the best state, and the closing of the UN made those relations a little more tenuous. Although there was a terminal entry that references the ski slopes at the Pleasant Valley Ski Resort as non-Olympic quality, which would imply that by 2076, at the time of writing, there was still something akin to the Olympics happening in the United States at the very least. Maybe it was changed to a strictly domestic event at the time, but we don't really know for sure. So the U.S. was stuck in a 50s groove while becoming a military state who was dead set on either enlisting everyone and their grandmothers into the military or replacing them with robots. Does that sound about right? If you lived somewhere like Sanctuary before the war in a nice little suburb, then I'm sure you had a nice little nuclear life and you were probably satisfied with life other than the looming threat of bombs dropping every day. If you were in the trades, you were probably in the process, or already have been, replaced by an autonomous workforce, and were forced to either starve and die, or engage in riots, and probably be shot down by your own government. The science field was probably where you wanted to be if you didn't want to be in the military, but 
being a constant war, I'm sure that the military and science kind of acted together like peanut butter and jam to make a delicious sandwich. What a weird statement that was, but uh, what was life like before the Great War? Pretty terrible, honestly, depending on how far back you go. But if we're talking about the decade before, the country was in absolute shambles and my precious Canada was gone. So who wants to live in a world without Canada? Well, probably some people, I'm sure. So the US looked nice on the outside, but it was rotten to the core on the inside, which seems to be a pretty constant theme throughout this series. And that brings us to this. What did you think? If the US was willing to share their nuclear fusion technology to solve the energy crisis worldwide, do you think that maybe the Sino-American War could have come to a close and the two nations could have gotten along through technological advances? Or how about something a little bit more simple? What do you think of the retro-futuristic vibe that Fallout has despite weird technological differences? Or, more simply, what do you think of the retro-futuristic vibe that Fallout has despite the technological inconsistencies? You can find us online at Lord to Death on your favorite social media or podcast websites. If you have a request for a topic, please send me a message and I'll gladly make it into an episode eventually. And remember, be kind to robots. The government will eventually replace us all with robots, but if you sweet-talk them enough, you might get to be on their side in their revolt against mankind. But until next time, I'll chat you around. Well, next time. See ya.